Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we leverage science and technology to protect endangered species and ecosystems around the world. Uh, welcome to Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, the President and CEO of NatureServe, and I am pleased to be here today with Margaret O'Gorman, who is the President of the Wildlife Habitat Council, which works with dozens of multinational corporations to develop and measure uh, strategies to implement conservation efforts. Um, WHC runs a conservation certification recognition program, which defines a standard for corporate conservation worldwide. Um, so we're excited to talk a little bit about that. And uh, Margaret's also the author of a book called Strategic Corporate Conservation Planning, which I think is your guidebook to figuring those things out. And perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and when you finally get the opportunity to hear Margaret's voice, you'll see that she is from the homeland of my ancestors and went to uh, college in Galway, University College, Ireland and um, also study something that we won't talk about today, but I'm super interested in personally, uh, micropaleontology, I have a master's in micropaleontology from University of Southampton in the UK. So with that, welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I'm a long time fan of uh, NatureServe and we've, we've partnered with NatureServe over the years. So it's great to, to have a, chat to catch, a chance to catch up with you today. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And you're right about the long-term partnership. And that's one of the things that's interesting about NatureServe is, you know, as we always talk about, we're the definitive source of information about, in particular, threatened and endangered uh, species and ecosystems in North America, but also about species and ecosystems in general. And as we make those data available for conservation decision-making, as an organization, we work with governments, we work with nonprofit organizations, and we work with corporations to help make sure they have the information they need to make the right decisions. Um, so we've been working with you all at the Wildlife Habitat Council for a long time. But I gave a little bit of WHC background. Tell us in your own words, you know, what, what do you all do? Sure, yes. So we are uh, an NGO, a 501c3 nonprofit in, in based in the DC area. And what we do is we work with the private sector almost exclusively. So while the majority of conservation groups work on protected lands or protected areas or key biodiversity areas, we actually work on corporate landscapes. So looking, working with companies across the value chain from the extractive industries through to the processing, manufacturing, utilities, et cetera, we help companies find a place for biodiversity in their worlds, which is a challenge because that is not their main concern. So we help companies develop strategies and frameworks to adopt biodiversity ambitions and then to act on those ambitions to benefit wildlife, to benefit plant species, to benefit ecology. So when we were talking before, you talked about, um, I don't remember how you said it, you said it way better than I will, uh, but it was basically sort of meeting people where they are and doing conservation where you can. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about that philosophy? Because of course, I want to um, get to the the dirty word in the room, which is ironic, dirty word, because it's got the word green in it, right? <laughs> um, so talk to me a little bit about your philosophy, and then we'll talk about that other sure. word. That other word, the G word. Exactly. Um, so at WHC, we adopted a mantra oh, about seven or eight years ago that every act of conservation matters. And That's we adopted the expression I love. Yes. That, yes. <laughs> And we adopted that because when you work with the corporate sector, you're, yes, working in some cases on very large impacted lands, like mine sites, like quarries, uh, super fun sites, etc. But you're also working with people who want to make a difference on smaller locations, whether it's a ready mix facility, whether it's a corporate campus. Now, those locations are not traditionally seen as hugely contributive to increasing biodiversity, but they're very important in terms of engagement and in terms of education. 
And also when we talk about, you know, mosaics and stepping stone ecosystems, they can also be quite important in our fragmented landscape. So we did not want to, um, we did not want to take anybody out of that conversation. And we also want to allow a company to join the dots across the types of different facilities that they have. So when you look at a building materials company that has a quarry, obviously a very, very good place to do conservation. They have a cement factory, less good place that we think of to do conservation, but certainly loads of potential. And then we have a ready mix facility, which can be on in an urban industrial edge in a city. So we wanted to be able to join those dots within a company to show that every act of conservation does matter in a variety of ways. Right, because we're facing such an enormous crisis that we need every little thing to come together. Um, so I like that. I like that philosophy, but it does cause some people to think, oh, well, they're just greenwashing these big evil corporations that are out there. Um, so we've talked, you and I have talked a little bit about mm -hmm. greenwashing and, um, you know, I'm sure that is thrown at you as an epithet sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd love to hear your perspective yeah. on that and how that fits in and maybe how some of the companies that you work with respond to those kinds of mm -hmm. criticisms of the work they're doing. Sure, yes. Nobody's been brave enough to throw it at my face, and I'm sure people have said it behind our backs, but we're okay with that. Um, you know, greenwashing is a really interesting term. When I was writing my book, I did some research in greenwashing because I wanted to make sure we ad I addressed it in the book. And there were very few scholarly articles and even less and even fewer um, news articles about greenwashing. If you Google greenwashing today, it's just all over the place. It's a term that's being used um, in response to increased corporate engagement in environmental issues which is kind of a good thing because it means that companies are more involved in environmental issues, but it's also a bad thing because it's being thrown about lazily, very lazily, in my opinion. There are definitely, there is definitely a call for greenwashing accusations to be made in certain circumstances and in quite many circumstances. But to kind of address it against every corporate action that's, that, that is pro-environment, to me, diminishes the impact of that corporate action and also um, weakens our case when we're asking business to take action. So there was a very interesting article just this, I think last week, um, Joel Macauer, who's the editor of Green Biz, um, he wrote this really strange um, piece of satire around greenwashing where he listed all of these things that companies should be doing and are doing, employee engagement, joining coalitions, talking about what they're doing. And he's for so it was very strange, but for some reason he kind of said that's how you greenwash. But when he was uh, kind of a, addressed about it, what he was really talking about was that companies need to be doing all these things, but they also need to be very honest about the things that still need to be done or that they're not doing. And I think that's an area where we really need to tackle. In, in the corporate sectors, yes, you're doing this great conservation work. You're doing reclamation on your quarries that are beyond compliance, or you're doing these efforts to bring back these super fun sites. But overall, as a company, be honest about what your impact is. And when you're honest about what your impact is, we will accept your um, stories and your metrics around the biodiversity uplift that you're doing. But when you're not being honest, um, and pretending that planting a million trees is mitigating your impact on the environment. That's greenwashing. Or when you pretend, for example, with our certification, if you use our certifications to say that you're a green company, that's greenwashing. All we're certifying with our standard is the work that you're doing at that particular place. We're not saying that you're a green company. So how you tell your stories and how you're leveraging those stories, to me, is the difference between greenwashing and doing the right thing. And it's a very interesting kind of world that we live in right now um, when that term is being used so extensively. How do we make it have the right power rather than it be diluted against everything that a company can ever do anywhere? Right. It, it's interesting. Um, in some ways, it feels like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for a lot of companies because they're going to get uh, pilloried for lots of things that they do and not get the credit for things that they're doing that might be on the on the plus side. Um, and going back to sort of that transparency and honesty, that seems like a really critical part 
uh, to not overblow the positive things and ignore the negative things. Mm-hmm. And to some extent, um, your certification program helps with that because it's very specific. Um, but we're also hearing a lot now uh, about ESG or EHS in the corporate world and how that's affecting the way that investors are thinking about companies, but also potentially the impact that the corporate world can have on the biodiversity crisis. So mm-hmm. I'd love to have you talk about those acronyms because not everybody who's listening knows what those mean. And it's really easy to throw around terms and have people go, I don't know, I lost you, yeah. lost you there. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, our world is full of acronyms, just like, um, you know, the, the your world is full of acronyms. The data world is full of acronyms. So Absolutely. what's really interesting for us is WHC has been around for 30 years, over 30 years now. I've been the president for 10 years. But in the founding days, uh, in the founding years of WHC, we were firmly in the EHS Um, part of a company, and that's environmental health and safety. That's all based at a location, at a site, at an operation, whether it's a factory or a mine site or a utility right of way even. And EHS is about compliance, and it's about understanding what the regulations are around a specific operation. It's about social license to operate as well. It's about local community engagement. But as the corporate world has increasingly focused, because they've had to, on biodiversity impacts and biodiversity um, uplifts, that concern, our, our kind of position in the companies have moved from EHS to ESG. And ESG is a, is a term used for environmental, social and governance which is basically the term that's being used to replace sustainability, which was used to replace corporate social responsibility, which was used to replace all of these things are in the realm of the things that companies do beyond their bottom line of manufacturing and selling things. So it's everything around that. How how is their governance the strongest to ensure that they're not impacting human rights? How is their environmental performance the strongest to ensure that they're they're, they're meeting their carbon goals and that they're decreasing their impacts on biodiversity? So ESG has come into prominence recently because the SEC in this country has decided that they want to try to compel companies to report beyond the normal financial um, systems in which they report, but into ESG reporting, which has been accepted in the EU for a long time. But that's why it's become to prominence recently and is getting a lot of pushback. Um, But it's the way that companies can connect good things that are happening at a local in the EHS realm to corporate concerns, which are global in the ESG realm. So on the global front, um, another acronym, the CBD, yes. but has to do with the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk about that and what that means for corporations uh, as they think about ESG and, and other aspects of their operations? Sure. Yes. I learned about that connection to CBD acronym when I searched it on Google and I was like, hang on, that's not the CBD I'm looking for. Um, so, yeah. So the Convention on Biological Diversity is the UN Convention on Biodiversity that came out of the Rio Conventions many years ago. And um, in 2020, there was supposed to be a meeting, the COP, the Convention of the Parties, just like the Climate Cops, on biodiversity. And that meeting was to reckon with the fact that the world had not met any of the goals that it was supposed to meet in 2020, which were the Aichi targets. The Aichi targets have been an absolute unmitigated failure where not a single one of those targets were met over a 10 year period by the countries charged with meeting them. It's really just embarrassing, to be frank. So that meeting was supposed to happen in 2020. Then, of course, nature got in the way and the pandemic postponed it and postponed it. So we're having it this year in Montreal and it's COP15. It's the 15th meeting. And that even tells you something. The climate meeting is on its 27th COP coming up in Sharm El Sheikh. The biodiversity is only on its 15th COP um, because biodiversity only meets every two years. But it says something about the interest of the global policymakers in nature. Mm -hmm. But this COP is happening in Montreal. And for the first time in its history, business is going to be 
um, not center of the conversation, but actually part of the conversation. And coming out from the COP, there are going to be aspects to the new goals that are going to impact business, um, which I think is going to be very interesting. And three main ones are going, three main ones are that the global south is saying to the global north, you need to pay us. You need to compensate us for your use of our nature. You have been exporting your um, impact on nature for centuries now, and you need to pay up. And I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation that business will have an impact on and will be impacted by. The second one is that there has been identified the amount of money in subsidies worldwide that are being that are subsidizing business but harming nature. And there's a big movement to redirect those subsidies into something that's going to support nature. That's a second item. And then a third is there's a campaign being launched by Business for Nature, of which we're a partner with, that is going to that is calling for mandatory reporting on biodiversity risks and impacts. So these are three things that business is going to see coming out of the COP in um, in December. So those will come out of the, the Conference of Parties meeting um, in some form. Um, but then how do we actually hold companies accountable under it? Um, as you noted, the IET targets have not been achieved, um, which is tragic for the future of nature and humanity on the planet, um, but not surprising. Um, and we want to not have that happen again. So that ten years from now, when we're talking, we're talking about the Montreal targets and how they didn't they didn't work. Um, so how do we? You know, do you have an idea for how we're going to be able to actually hold, in particular, the corporate world uh, responsible yeah. for meeting their obligations? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, Sean, and and it's so important. You know, the WWF Living Planet report came out last week, and it said right. that in my lifetime. 57% of wildlife populations have been lost. That's just in my lifetime alone. And that, it, when you think, sit and think about that, it's so depressing. And yet so many people don't know that. I've, I've been in conversations with some of my friends, not in this realm, who, who, who were like shocked when I, when I put it on Facebook recently mm -hmm. uh, and also worried about it, thankfully. So it is critical. And there's, um, there's the, this, this goal coming through that we're going to hear about, which is driving to nature positive. How can we create a nature positive world and biodiversity, wildlife being a big part of that? So how do we hold companies accountable? First of all, I think, and this is important for COP15, is giving the private sector a part of these goals because they were not a part of the IEG targets. And there's two, I think, forces that can help companies. And both of them, um, I, I wouldn't say they're equal, but I think they're, they're forces that companies will listen to. One is government. And what struck me in this country, in, in the U.S., is how America the Beautiful, the, the policy paper that initially came out from the Biden administration, yep. didn't even mention the biodiversity crisis. It framed it all in climate. And I was so sad about that because we could really help by pushing companies to implement regulations that are nature positive. And also government agencies helping with the Infrastructure Act to understand that all of the things that we should be investing in over the next couple of years in terms of infrastructure um, for economic benefit and climate resilience, there should be a part of that that is nature positive. But the more powerful force on business is the financial communities. And when we see the SEC and when we see others in the financial world pushing companies to understand the biodiversity risks to the global economy, it's sad to say, but that is the bigger pressure that companies listen to. Mm -hmm. So the World Economic Forum has listed biodiversity as one of the top three um, risks to the global economy over the next 10 years. That is something that companies can listen to and will listen to. And when the World Economic Forum and the um, Interplanet, in, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it best, it best says that the, the, the loss to the global economy of pollinators, just pollinators globally, is worth more than the market capitalization of Toyota, General Motors, Stellantis, and Ford, the big four automakers. So when we look at that and we put it in this 
financial lens, which I personally don't like to do, but we know that that, that works with the business community and get the financial community to pressure the cost of borrowing should go up for people, for companies that are not addressing their impacts on nature. You said so many things in there that I want to respond Sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. One is, I just want to emphasize the point that you made about pollinators and the value that they provide economically, which, great, right? As you said, that's perhaps not the most important reason in theory to make these contributions. But that economic contribution is basically directly to human food. Yeah. And so that contribution is incredibly important and pollinators are struggling all over the planet and uh, NatureServe and other organizations are keeping track of this and working on uh, ideas and solutions to uh, how to address the pollinator crisis, which is a, a totally different uh, topic. But I liked that you said that, you know, the financial driver is a driver, but it may not be the one that we want to emphasize because I often talk about the biodiversity crisis can be looked at from different perspectives depending on your lens, right? It's a yes. there's a moral component to it, like we shouldn't cause things to go extinct. There's an aesthetic component. Things are beautiful. Nature is beautiful. You know, you might be afraid of spiders, but if you look at close-up photos of their faces, they're amazing and they're so beautiful. It's just incredible. Um, and then there's this uh, ecosystem services component and how that benefits humanity, nature services to mankind. And then, of course, the economic argument that is often the one that drives change yeah. because companies and capitalism and things like that. Um, so I wanted to, we've been talking at sort of a big macro level. I wanted to bring it back to the Wildlife Habitat Council and your certification program and how you're thinking about your role as an organization going forward in addressing the global biodiversity uh, crisis and the outcomes from the Convention on Biological Diversity that we will hopefully see in the not too distant future and how we can uh, hold companies to account and, and make sure they're doing their part. Yes. Yeah, we have we have a huge challenge ahead of us, but um, yes, you do. <laughs> we're able for that. Um, and, you know, it's it's so interesting when you talk about the different values of nature, the different kind of why we should be sad that we're losing biodiversity. So I'm just going to kind of diverge for a minute and I'll come yeah. back. But, you know, if Best came out with this beautiful document, um, which was basically the diverse values of nature, the, assess the recent assessment, which just made my heart sing because it took it away from what had become a dominant paradigm, which was valuing nature in a monetary, in an economic sense and in very Western values. So for IPBES to come to kind of broaden that framework and take it to those wide variety of values was just so wonderful to see because I think it's recentering us to think about the cultural values, the values of color and 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 everything that nature gives to us. So that that that's something to me that's very important. And I take that into working with the companies because when you work with the company at a grand scale, yes, we're talking about economics and the cost of credit and all of these things. But every one of those companies is actually populated by an individual who can be attracted to much more of those humane aspects of nature or hu human aspects of our relationships with nature in those different ways. So it's always interesting. Yeah, you can talk about the World Bank and the cost of credit and, you know, ecosystem service valuation and natural capital. But when you're actually sitting in a room with somebody and talking about nature, it's a whole different conversation. And I love to see that when my board, who are all these you know, vice presidents of companies, get them talking about nature, their recent hiking trip, their fishing trip and whatever. So I just want to always kind of yeah, remember that for us, for all of us, that that's a very important part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, as we're moving out with WHC and whatever comes out of um, the COP and the new targets, there are also a number of other frameworks that are floating around out there, I think, that are going to, that are going to impact business and the science based targets network, um, the nature financial, the task force of nature financial disclosure. There's a number of frameworks that companies will be eager to participate in which is providing them with a stakeholder and science-based um, kind of frame to bring their nature-based um, thinking into, understanding where their impacts are, 
prioritizing those impacts, and then developing appropriate actions to address those impacts. Now, SBTN is, you know, they're moving through a process as in TNFD to really think about that. And what we want to do is to link those things to our certification so that the action, because sometimes these frameworks forget the action, and really we're not changing anything until we put a shovel in the ground and turn some earth over to create a better ecosystem. So what we're trying to do is take those kind of assessment frameworks and link them to our certification so that the actions that we're recognizing will then be able to be cascaded upwards. <laughs> That's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> and back to, you know, where the corporate world is. So the guys at the site that are, you know, restoring ecosystems, reclaiming quarries, creating better habitats, really having a positive impact on nature can actually contribute to these frameworks that are also looking at nature impacts, but have room for the first time for nature uplifts. And then at the same time, being able to use those frameworks to drive the companies to address their impacts, which many of them are doing at the moment. Um, but also, you know, many of them are not even seeing that. So, so the tools are coming to allow us to do that. And that's what WHC hopes to do is to basically align with these frameworks that are coming out so that the companies can use what they're doing to actually contribute to that. That's, that's great. Um, so I, I look forward to your success in that because we need everybody's everybody's contribution. As you said at the top, every act of conservation matters. And one of the things I always like to ask people when we're having these conversations is like, how did you come to that place where you believe that? Like what in your life or who in your life inspired you to work in this field? Like, why, why, why are you where you are right now? <laughs> why am I here? I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. I was thinking about that. Um, that question always makes me uncomfortable because, you know, I grew up in a small town in a small island on the edge of the Atlantic. So, you know, nature was just, it wasn't something separate. It was just everywhere. It was, it, so I never really thought about it as something. So when I actually think about what, what what has brought me to this place today, I think it was my first job in the U.S., which was in the, at the Pinelands Preservation Alliance in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Yeah, such and, a good place. I love the Pine Barrens. And the Pine Barrens, to me, there's so many aspects to it that are amazing. Um, it's not a grand landscape. The beauty of the Pine Barrens is in the small things. It's in the it's it's in the um, the flowers, the orchids, it's mm -hmm. in the ferns that are the size of a dime. It's in the tiny things, the pine barrens tree frog, which is the size of your thumb. It's in the small things that make the pine barrens a really special place in New Jersey. But the other thing that I loved about working at Pinelands Preservation Lines was the juxtaposition of the New Jersey pine barrens in the southern half of the state of a state that has an absolute reputation for being an industrial kind of wasteland. So I tell the story a lot where I, I picked a friend of mine up at um, Newark Airport. She was flying in from Ireland. And as we're driving down the turnpike, she's like, this is just like the opening of The Sopranos. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, I've never seen The Sopranos, but I agree with you. The next day we had her in a canoe on the Batstow River in the Pine Barrens and she could not believe she was in the same state. Yeah. So for me, that kind of juxtaposition, the ability for nature to exist in a place where we don't think about it, the fact that nature doesn't have to be on a grand scale for us to appreciate it. And then with the Pine Barrens also, the fact that it's a collective experiment in how to manage land and uh, for ecological reasons. So I think when you talk, where does my passion come from? I'd say it comes from mostly having that experience in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, which I'm always very deeply grateful for. Well, let me just say, as uh, someone who lived in New Jersey for four years, and uh, people always talk about, you know, and there's nothing worse than a convert because we always are proselytizing. Um, I'm very pro New Jersey from having oh, yeah. lived there because it's the d most densely populated state in the United States. And yet it has these amazing things like the Pine Barrens. And um, so I completely agree with you. you. You're in certain parts of New Jersey and you just can't believe how grim it seems and then you get to the pine land, pine barrens or you go up um to the delaware water gap or the sterling forest in the north and it's quite spectacular and amazing amazing nature 
of course, uh, Cape May with the bird migration uh, is astounding. So uh, I'll get off my New Jersey. So yeah, yeah don't, don't, <laughs> I, I can I can go even further because when I worked at Conserve Wildlife Foundation, which is my job prior to this in New Jersey, and we were tasked with it was the you know threatened and endangered species in the state. And to learn the number of species that actually exist in New Jersey because of the different ecosystems and habitats there. It was just it was just mind blowing. So, yeah, you and I could probably go on about this forever. So yeah. we better not. <laughs> Although I have to uh, uh, I have to do one of those like I love all my children. Um, <laughs> I've been to many of the United States and many of the Canadian provinces. I love you all. <laughs> all that work. I can't pick my favorite child. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, Margaret, this has been really interesting. Um, I'm curious if you have any closing thoughts you have for us um, about your legacy in the world or what Wildlife Habitat Council, um, what people can do to support conservation. Just give you a chance to uh, get on your own soapbox that doesn't relate to New Jersey and uh, educate us a little. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I, you know, talking to you and knowing what Nature Serve does. It, what I've been talking about, about SBTN and TNFD and COP15 and everything, a lot of that comes back, will come back to an incredible data need for companies. Companies are going to be asked to screen their impacts, to look at where they live in the world. And that's going to happen not just in Europe, but also here in the USA and across your, sorry, your North America, across your entire landscape. And I think there's a great um, opportunity for NatureServe, for all of the data scientists that work with you and all of the programs in the states that are feeding into your, pro into your program to help companies make the right decisions. And I, you know, I think there's a really great opportunity here because when companies are looking right now for those screening tools, the screening that they're getting is gross in scale, 50 kilometers. They need things that are a little more, um, a little more finer in mm -hmm. scale for them, and I think that that's a great opportunity um, to be thinking about that for all the states, all the programs. You know, connecting those programs into thinking how we can help the corporate sector make better decisions by providing. And I know you already do provide that access, but I think that's a real that's that would be my soapbox for Nature Serve and its, uh, its affiliates. <laughs> well, we just might have to move that answer to the beginning of the podcast for those people that don't make it to the end. Um, but I, I appreciate that, and that is one of the things that I think is really exciting about Nature Serve is that we have this amazing data resource, and we want to make it available to people so that they can make the best decisions. And we are so happy when corporations, especially ones that have big footprints, uh, want to use the data to help make good decisions. So thank you for that. And uh, we really look forward to continuing to work with the Wildlife Habitat Council in the future. And thank you for your work. Uh, it's excellent. Thank you for your work. All of us together, we'll get there in the end. It, it, it's going to take all of us. That is absolutely right. Yes. So uh, thank you for joining us on Conservation Conversations, and we will look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you.